Hello again, this is Dr. Jim Nardis from Cardiovascular Interventions and welcome to our series. Today is a very important subject. The subject is the Kraft test. This is a glucose and insulin test. It's a blood test and we administer it right here in our office. This test involves drawing blood at baseline, half an hour, one hour, two hours, and three hours after drinking sugar water. What's the point? Well, we want to see how much your glucose goes up and how much your insulin level goes up. So you've heard of the glucose tolerance test where you're monitoring your sugar response. How high does your sugar go? Are you a diabetic or not? And we found that many of my patients who I suspected may be a diabetic because they have hardening of the arteries, they've had heart attacks, they've had strokes. But when you look at the hemoglobin A1C, which is a sure sign of diabetes, or you look at the blood sugar levels, they're normal. So you say, well, they don't have diabetes, but then why do they have such severe heart disease? And over the past five to 10 years, we've realized that a large number of these patients may not be diabetic, but they're pre-diabetic, which is a condition that is extremely detrimental to the arteries. If you have pre-diabetes, you're gonna get hardening of the arteries very prematurely, and it goes undiagnosed. So these patients don't even know that they have it because they go to the doctor, they get the hemoglobin A1C, they get the sugar levels, and they are normal. So they think that all for all practical purposes, they're not a diabetic, they're doing fine. So this test has been done to show that no, it's not your sugar level only, it's your insulin in the background and how high it is that determines your risk factor of developing hardening of the arteries, strokes, heart attacks, dementia, obesity, fatty liver, atherogenic dyslipidemia, high blood pressure, all these are conditions associated with high insulin levels. So I'm gonna explain this test a little bit to you. So if you give somebody some sugar water and you'd expect their sugar levels to increase, but by two hours they start coming back down and then back to baseline. And that's the response that normal patients get. Now a diabetic of course will be way off the mark but then he's already established as a diabetic patient. Here we have a pre-diabetic who will have a normal sugar response. But if you measure their insulin levels in a normal response, you would expect to show that the insulin goes up and down. And that's a normal curve. But in pre-diabetic patients, the insulin goes way up and then down. And this is the abnormal response that I'm looking for. They make so much insulin. And that brings the sugar level down. But look how much insulin it took to bring that sugar level down. That is insulin resistance. The body's just not responding to this much insulin. So it has to produce massive amounts. They have resistance to insulin. Why would you have resistance to insulin? Multiple reasons why you have resistance to insulin, which we'll come to in just a second. So the way we do this test is we administer the sugar water, we measure the insulin levels at half hour, one hour, two hours, and three hours, and we document that, my goodness, the sugar levels may are good, but the insulin levels are sky high. This patient has hyperinsulinemia. He failed the test. He's got a positive Kraft test. So the question is, why would you make so much insulin? And the reason is you have insulin resistance, and that's driven by five major factors. The first one is eating too frequently. Every time you eat, your insulin level goes up. And if within an hour and a half or two hours, you're eating again and again, every two hours, you're constantly having high insulin levels in the body, the body will become resistant to the effects of insulin. So the next time you eat, you have to produce a massive amount of insulin to get the same effect on your sugar. So a hormone cannot stay elevated all the time. There has to be cyclical increases in your hormone levels, not constant, because then you become resistant. The second reason is 
too much sugar in the diet. So what you do eat, if it produces a rise in your sugar, and that goes up with consuming sugar and also starches and concentrated carbohydrates, then your blood sugar level will go up a little bit, but it'll take a lot of insulin to bring that down because you have in, you'll develop insulin resistance. The third reason is fructose. Excess amounts of fructose will produce insulin resistance over time. And fructose is found today, not only in drinks, but also in all processed foods. Too much fructose and fructose will cause insulin resistance at the level of the liver. And then the fourth reason why they can get insulin resistance is because of liver disease from alcohol and other causes that can cause liver disease. And you'll get insulin resistance that way as well. And then the last one, which is the big one, is processed foods. If you eat something that's processed, then the same food in the unprocessed uh, form will only produce a small insulin rise. But if it's processed, there'll be a huge increase in your insulin. This is also known as the incretin effect. And it's a little complicated, but bottom line is, if I give you the food in its whole food form, versus if I process it and powderize it, or make it into a flour, or process it and then give it to you in a form that is not recognizable anymore, it's man-made, it's made in a factory, it's gonna produce a lot of insulin because of insulin resistance. The amount of insulin produced is totally different. Same calories, same food, but in a different form. And these are the five things we've been doing today. That's why we see an epidemic of prediabetes. And of course, this will eventually lead to diabetes itself because when the insulin levels cannot go any higher, then the blood sugar will eventually start going up and then you develop diabetes. So even this massive amount of insulin will not control sugar. So you will develop diabetes in the future if you have a positive test. So the point of identifying these patients early on is because we can make great strides with lifestyle changes and diet so that the insulin resistance can be restored. Can it go back to normal? Of course it can. You can shift this down. There are lifestyle changes, dietary changes that are needed to do this. We don't have medicines to do this. That's why the responsibility then falls on the patient to do it. And they need the right advice, the right diet, the right lifestyle. Then your insulin sensitivity will come back. And you can look around and I can pretty much tell who has insulin resistance. Insulin puts everything into storage. Where? In the liver. So they get a fatty liver and then in the viscera. So they all have a large abdominal girth. That is insulin resistance. They're not obese all over, but it's all around the belly. And then the HDL is low. The triglycerides are high. Their blood pressures are high. And these patients will have an almost normal hemoglobin A1C. It'll be usually less than six. And the blood sugars, not bad, 100, 120. So if you're simply looking for diabetes, you're gonna miss this huge group of patients who have insulin resistance. And this is the elephant in the room when it comes to atherosclerosis. And if we can bring this curve down and reduce your insulin response, your prognosis will change dramatically. When insulin levels come down, patients automatically lose weight because insulin is a storage molecule. So automatically they start lo losing the weight and it's all fat loss. And these patients' blood pressures come down, their liver function gets better, they feel better, they sleep better, and the risk of developing cardiovascular disease goes down tremendously. Because those of my patients who have the best insulin levels don't get progression of disease anymore. And you can repeat this test. So let's say that you are on my program for six months, then we repeat the test and we show there's been a vast improvement in the insulin response. That's how you can tell that they're doing better. So the craft test is something new. 
We do it right here in the office. It requires a three hour blood test, but it's well worth it. And I hope that this has been very educational for you. And if you like this video, please click like and please subscribe to my channel. And I'll see you for the next educational channel. Bye.